Good morning and welcome to Southside. We're grateful for any visitors that we might have with us to come and worship our God together. So we're grateful to have you. I got a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, the nursing home, uh, we have a ministry at one nursing home. We have another one who's wanting us to come and begin a Bible study or a service. So if you would be interested uh, in teaching at one of those, uh, we have uh, Logan Harney would be willing to train you up and, and help you in that. So see Logan or see me afterwards if you'd be interested in that. <coughs> Young Marrieds, we're going to start back up this Thursday, and we're going to now take that series that we've been watching from Paul Tripp, and we're going to flip it. So you'd go to the marriage or the parenting one. That will begin at 6.30 at the church this Thursday. Uh, I pray um, that you were blessed last Sunday by the ministry of Pat Braddy, a dear brother of mine who wrote The Call to Mission that we've been studying. And it's our call to be deliberate and focused on the Great Commission so we don't lose sight of why we're here on this earth. Why has God not brought us home? We don't want to become a club for nice people. But Paul wrote in, in Philippi, he said that we're, we have koinonia in the gospel, that we share, we participate, we're, we're one together in the gospel of Jesus Christ to believe it and to spread it and to advance the kingdom. So that as, as a church, we're, we're united in the gospel. We're, we're a gospel community by the grace of God and Jesus Christ. We're united by faith, seeking to grow in the gospel together and in each other and to take it to the ends of the earth starting with our everyday life connections is what CTM was helping us grow in. And, and I believe this with all my heart. If you lose sight of this, it stunts your growth. When, when your Christianity becomes for you alone, I, I just think it, you, you spend your whole life saying, why am I not growing? Well, why do I just feel dead and dry? And, and you just lose sight of this beautiful picture of all of us laboring together to advance the kingdom of God. And I believe the best way to fulfill the Great Commission is through church planting. Paul Washer, they asked him, if you could do one thing in your life, what would it be? He said, I would plant one church. And as we go full throttle then and journeying forward in church planting, we got some exciting things to share with you here in the next month. I just want you to be thinking this way as we present what God's doing, that it takes a community, a community all together stepping up to, to plant churches and advance the kingdom. It's, it's, it's going to be groups going out, and it, it takes trust and faith when you say goodbye to the, some of the people that you sit next to every week and you love and you care about. Um, it, it's going to take some who are sitting saying, look, those needs are taken care of. I'm just going to sit back. It's, it's going to take people pressing forward and stepping up in all areas to be serving, to rising up to be leaders. Uh, it's not that we have enough. We're going to need more and more. And we need to be praying then for this koinonia and the gospel together. And so I want us to be thinking this way, um, journeying together as a body. And I think what it will do for your spiritual life as well uh, is unbelievable when, when you, you have a vision for what it is that we're doing. And so Romans has awakened me uh, to this call. And so get ready. I'm coming. I'm fired up. My heart has never been more. Uh, I like when Paul said, be fervent, be, be boiling for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the days that I have left are just going to be spent for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I'm the only one standing here in five years because everybody's out on mission, I'll be happy. I'll be happy. I'm, I'll be cool with that. So I think I could save you 10 weeks young marrieds, you don't need videos. <laughs> if you give your life to the Great Commission, me and Laura would love a, a do-over and a lot of things that we've learned about marriage and parenting and all of that. But if you give your life to the Great Commission, I'm telling you what it does for marriages, for kids, to just see, it, it makes up for a million mistakes when we're all laboring together for the, the name that is above every name. And so I just encourage you to Give your life. So still come for the videos, but if you want to save 10 weeks, give your life to the Great Commission, and you will see abundant blessing in every area of your life. Or you can coast, 
Try to make yourself as comfortable as possible adding Jesus to your busy life, to, to the rest of your days, uh, and you'll need videos till the return of Jesus Christ. Because it, 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 it will break and just not work the way God designed it. It's not for you to become this, this little cul-de-sac and, and, and live for yourself and your little families. It's, it's all of us working as conduits for the kingdom of God, for his advancement. And so if you wish to save your life in this world, you're, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, Jesus says, for my name's sake, you'll, you'll gain it. And so I'm just asking you that we would together by faith lose our lives for King Jesus and do everything we can to see the spread. I, I was reading or heard in a sermon, a statistic that in, in a church over 10 years, I think, it's, I think he said 90% of people who join it are just transfers from other churches. And in a church plant, 80% of the new people have never been to church in their lives. And so it's a, it's a beautiful way that God uses to advance the kingdom. And so I just, again, I'm, I'm just passionate that we all see our part and we join together in every way to see the spread of the gospel. And it's not just me and God and forget about everything else. It, this is where you're going to thrive when we have koinonia and the fellowship of the gospel. So that's for free. That's for free. Our current section in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> it has much to teach in this age and the day that we live in. I like the, the passage that Matteo read in Philippians 2. This morning, our, our culture is crumbling before our eyes. Our structures and our government are legislating and operating in, in areas in ungodly ways. There are laws that are being considered and passed as we sit here that will bring increased persecution upon the people of God, even from government. And, and, and what should be our general rule and principle then of heart toward these governmental structures, and that's what Paul's dealing with in Romans 13. And what I declared two weeks, I'm sorry I made you wait two weeks, but some of you needed it. You're, you're looking better today. I like it. Um, we need to have peace of mind and heart. We, we, I, 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 my hope is not in government. It's not in America. My hope is in we're citizens of another country. And so I just got peace like a river as all these things are going on. I hate unrighteousness. I'm going to teach you at the end that we should fight. We should want to advance truth, but not to lose the, the peace that God is unfolding this world exactly according to design and what he has purposed. And so I know, I know I'm an idiot, but I remember during COVID when everything was at its worst and my ending application was go have babies. And you're like, what, what is he talking about? Go have babies? Yeah. Quit being afraid. Everyone's like, I don't know if I want to bring a child into this world. Bring a child into this world. I'm telling you, I had to raise kids in a, a school where it was applauded if you stood for Jesus. You were voted homecoming king if you made a little stance. And you try to raise kids in a country where everything's just made easy and everybody says, I believe the same thing. That's difficult. <laughs> Use birth control in a generation like that. But now you move into, this is hard, and there's persecution, and all these things are coming. Man, enter into it. Raise your children now with, there's a cost, there's a persecution, and they start to realize, yeah, there's something here to lose your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we got Jesus. Let's go. Romans 13, let me read it, and we will pray again. Romans 13:1. And this is the offering up your body as a living sacrifice to God. Paul is still teaching us. I want to live for God in every area of my life. God, how do I do it with government? And verse 1, <clears throat> every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority, hear that, except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. 
For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it's a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, <coughs> not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, and custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor <clears throat> to whom honor. I pray that that spirit would advance the kingdom of God in every one of our hearts, and that he would give us grace to, to have a pleasing worship and aroma to God by this kind of behavior. So let's go to our God and ask him to unfold this and teach us and guide us. Father, we come before you and we do. We look at the mercies of God in Christ Jesus and they are eternal, they're abundant, they're forever. Uh, we'll study them for all of eternity and never come to the end of them. And so God, as I look at what I do see in a mirror dimly, I want to offer up my body a living sacrifice to you. Here's my life. Let us serve the King of Kings. And I pray, Lord, as we look now in this area of governmental structures, Lord, how, how do we as the people of God uh, live as the people of God? How do we put you on display uh, in the middle of, of government? God, I pray, let this be uh, an act of service, an act of worship to every heart in this room. God, uh, move, guide us, give us wisdom and insight. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last two weeks ago, we began looking at this section, and I said, Paul's given us six reasons why we should submit to the governing authorities. That was our, our principal responsibility in verse one. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And so Paul is now taking that principle and working it out to help us, to help us get it into our hearts. There's a lot to think about in that principal responsibility. And last time we looked, the first reason is that this submission to the government is submission to God. It's, it's bringing yourself under God. He's established these authorities, and as we come under them, we're showing God our value to Him, our worship to Him. And so it is, it, it's submitting to God. Secondly, if you resist this authority, then it's saying it's God then who you're resisting. It, it's not the government it, it's God who's established them, and you're, you're resisting the God of the universe who we call Abba, Daddy, Father. And then thirdly, you're going to receive condemnation from God in verse 2. Uh, it says, they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves, and that's where we left off last time. <clears throat> we got three more points to look at. In verses 3 through 4 now, we're going to see another reason to submit is the purpose for why God has appointed rulers over us. Look with me in verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it's a minister of God, of God to you for good. And so the purpose why God has appointed rulers over us, as we said last time, I want to remind you that God has purposed to run this created world, this cosmos that he spoke into being to accomplish his purposes. And one of the ways that he will accomplish his purposes is through secular government. Through rulers and authorities, God will bring about his purposes. They're, they're his pawns. They're his instruments in working out his good pleasure that will end at the end with all praising and worshiping him. And so let's look at some of these reasons together that he set them up in this way. Paul will show us that they're good for society. John Calvin said this. He said, these authorities are to be rays of sunshine of God's grace. They're to be rays of sunshine of God's grace. I don't hear that on a daily basis. I haven't heard any of you ever use that phrase. They're to be rays of sunshine of God's grace. <clears throat> and again, the, the one saying this, Paul has been greatly abused by government for preaching Jesus. He, he's going to finish his race being martyred by this government. He's going to write three letters from prison for being in there for preaching Jesus Christ. So keep in mind that, that Paul didn't have it as bad as us today is what I, I hear from people. It couldn't be any further from the truth. Paul was in a very difficult place with government. So how is God 
ordaining government, he says, for our good. When the world's history is a history of corrupt government doing harm. Like, how, how, Paul, you feel out of touch to me as I read this. Help us. And so as we've learned in Romans, Paul never leaves a, st- a stone unturned. So let's turn over some stones. <clears throat> in Genesis 1-3, in the creation account, I hate to always do this to you, but could someone close that back shade for me so I don't get a migraine every time I look back at that beautiful group over here? Uh, Genesis 1-3. through 3. Thank you, brother. Um, the government was not ordained in creation. So the government is ordained after the fall. So you have the fall in the garden, sin entered the world, and death spread to all men. Then you come into chapter 4, and you got Cain killing Abel. You got Lamech boasting of killing a young boy. And God says in Genesis 6, he looks out and he saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so the fall has brought so much corruption and the whole earth now is just filled with violence. There's going to be a judgment, a flood, and man's sin just starts over and violence fills the earth again. And so what it is, is because of the fall, there's no internal restraint. So God puts an external one for the good of the world, to, to bless the world. I'm going to restrain evil with the, with the sword. Genesis 9, 5, he says, I will require your lifeblood. From every beast, I will require it. <clears throat> and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made them. You're killing image bearers of God. And so here's the delegation of authority, excuse me, to act as the restrainer of men. God is giving the sword to men. The institution of government to use force. This is big. Human government is not a redemptive institution. It's to provide preservation, not salvation. It was a gracious institution and, and we, or we would have made ourselves extinct. We would have just killed ourselves. And so it was instituted to preserve the race so the gospel of Jesus Christ could go forth for God's purposes. And so government was not created because man is so good, but because we're so bad. And it's a common grace to keep mankind from being as bad as they could possibly be. So what a gift from God. Hell will be people without any restraints to their evil. And so we have this restraining influence in our land. In verses 3 through 4, we're told it's a minister of God for your good. It's for the good of society. (coughs) It's, It's for a good purpose. It's God's common grace upon us. It restrains evil to bring peace and tranquility to to just that we can live out these lives to God. So thank you, God, for this gift. But it's nothing compared to the gift that you gave me in Jesus Christ. If you take away government and it's serving its purpose, uh, thank you that, that you will never take away what I need for life and godliness. So I have everything in Christ. I don't look for the government to fill what Christ has filled in my heart. So maybe a summary of these verses is what Paul is getting at. Uh, One commentator called it the fear factor. It's it's the fear factor for wrongdoing. So this government is to bring retributive justice. It's to bring punishment for crime. The government was given the sword to bring a fear for wrongdoing. It's a gift. To bring people into submission, uh, uh, not have criminal activities that, that hurt society and its citizens. So it needs government. Since it's not the gospel, uh, the gospel brings us into submission how? By the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. And this brings us into submission by a sword. It's to bring unbelievers into submission by the punishment of authorities. We come into submission. What I'm preaching now is because Jesus died for your sins. We come to worship our God. It's, It's our whole heart. We come under it. But they're coming under it for a sword. It's an amazing common grace, and and you see when it relaxes and when it diminishes, you will get more of a glimpse into the heart of mankind without its restraining influence. When I was at seminary, there was a a trial on a man named Rodney King, and when the verdict came down, there was an outbreak 
uh, of, uh, of uh, criminal, uh, just uh, I could not believe what I was seeing. I was living right in the middle of it. And, it. and I'm telling you, when you watch anarchy, it is a terrifying thing. And so the blessing to have government, sometimes we need to come back. I was talking to Ray, he was over in the Middle East, and he, he said a lot of these people, they, if they are, have cancer, they have to buy treatments on the, on the black market, and they don't even know if they'll work. And you start looking at some of the things that they go through and, and what we have, uh, what gifts, what a beautiful thing government is. How's that taste? Like vinegar? So if you want to have no fear of the sword, Paul said, do what is right, do what is good, obey the laws of the land. I don't have to walk around in fear. You can wave to the police officer as you drive by with the radar gun. No fear, he says, to do, do what is right. And so the government then must use the sword, and Paul knows what that means. If you go back to Romans 8, 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness or peril or sword? <coughs> sword was, was you being put to death. Using the sword, to, the government to, to put you to death. And so Paul knows what this is. And so capital punishment is right and biblical. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Lex talionis. Uh, led up with it, and rebellion will increase. And that is happening all over. When we had these little pockets that got rid of the police, uh, no consequences of crime, and the murder rates now are shocking, and the criminal rates are just rising. 1 Peter 2, 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. So the right to enforce laws by force is a right that is given to the state and not to the church. The church is never to take this power into her own hands. It tried in the Middle Ages after Constantine embraced Christianity and it was a bloody mess. The power of the sword was given to Caesar, not to the church. It cannot be used to advance the kingdom of God. We advance the gospel of Jesus Christ by truth and love, not the sword. And and that will will tie in then in a second for when can we resist. But how is the power of the sword to be used? Well, the power of the sword was used to defend its citizens from enemies within and and without, to, to wage war and to guard anarchy in its midst. It was to establish and exercise and maintain justice to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. Do what is right, and it's to commend you. It cannot develop morality from the heart. We'll never be able to legislate people into the kingdom of God. All it can do is punish it. Only, Only Christians can take the gospel and see hearts changed and develop morality. The greatest thing in a nation is Christians. Advance the gospel, and so the need is not for more laws. It's for more preaching. The gospel needs to go forth. We can't change hearts with laws. We can change hearts by preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so that is what we need to get. We need to do that. And are we? We've taken advantage of this season that we have to proclaim this gospel. So I, don't, I really don't think the government is, is falling down on its job as much as the church is. So I'm not saying the government is doing its job great. I'm just saying the church is falling down on its job. So this is a call to be the church of God. The church needs to quit trying to do the government's job and to be about our our calling to take Jesus into this world. So your submission to God, uh, the reason we submit is it's to God. If you resist, you're resisting God. Thirdly, you receive condemnation from the sword. And fourthly, from, from God, um, purpose, it's for good, um, why he put these rulers over us. And now the fifth one, he moves to another way to look at it. It's for conscience sake. Look with me in verse 6. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. <laughs> so the fear factor uh, is not the highest reason 
to submit. There's a, there's a better fear. There's the fear of God that's been put within our heart that loves God and wants to offer up its body a living sacrifice. I want the smile of God. I want to please Him. I want to give my life as a true offering. And so we submit out of the, the fear of wrath that they might punish us. But Paul moves it now to the good, to the believer for this healthy fear that ought to restrain us. And so it's for conscience sake. And that's what I've been coming after is your conscience through truth. Conscience is used 29 times in the Bible, four in the Old Testament, 20 times by the Apostle Paul. Most of Paul's usage is trying to have a clear conscience or, or a good conscience. Don't sear your conscience. Christian desire, he desires to do then what conscience demands. And so the conscience, we're going to look at it in chapters 14 in detail. So here, just roughly, it's kind of our inner lawyer. It's interesting, it was given in creation. So it's a beautiful gift from God. It's an inner umpire that has been given by God. It was part of creation, not the fall. And it is, it is a beautiful gift from God. I like it way better than government. But the, the two play together in our text. And it will introduce the next two chapters on conscience. How do we function together with different convictions in the body of Christ is going to be so important for working out our unity. <clears throat> but simply put, <coughs> fleshed out in detail in the next chapter, conscience approves what is good and it disapproves of what is bad, and it accuses me of guilt. And you can't do an end around on it. It's, it's this beautiful gift. It's an impartial faculty that passes judgment on our actions by accusing us or defending us. And so the argument is that we have a higher motive for submitting to government than others do. It's right to do so, and our conscience tells us, yes, we know that it matters to God. And if we say, like everyone else, these, these crazy laws, I don't like them. I, I didn't vote for it. I'm not going to obey it. Everyone else does it. it. It's just contributing to a spirit of lawlessness. The great tragedy of our country is that there's little or no respect for authority. You can almost see it on bumper stickers everywhere. Question authority. Uh, uh, MacArthur wrote a book called The Vanishing Conscience, is that we're, we're losing our conscience. We're searing them. We're scarring them. And so you can now sit and celebrate an abortion as if it's some kind of something to celebrate. And so you see the, the conscience is being seared and vanished. So we must listen to conscience in this area. If you're speeding and you see a, a police officer and the foot comes off the gas, you say, well, it, at least I don't have a fish on my car. Uh, if I'm late to my appointment, I won't have integrity. So I'm going to speed, and, and your conscience is saying, eh, that's wrong. You're, you're, you fish without a license. Paul, uh, you pull a quick one on your taxes, and, and he's just saying you have this conscience that, that will convict because we know what is true. Our conscience has been informed by the Bible and truth. And he's saying don't sear your conscience in this area. Acts 24, 16, Paul was on trial. He said, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. The government is not to be the church. The government is not to do our duty. It can make laws, but it cannot change hearts to keep them. It cannot advance the kingdom of God. It wasn't given to do that. It was given to restrain evil. And that is why the church must be the church. The gospel is the only way to reform society. Legislation won't fix the issues, guys, that we're facing this morning. Only changed hearts will. And what is more, God promises that this world will be broken all of our days until Christ returns and makes all things new. Don't fight the brokenness of our society with pea shooters. Fight it with the gospel of Jesus Christ that can take down strongholds and powers and forces and dominions. Let the government do its job and let the church do its job. Rise up, O men and women of God, and be done with lesser things. They both exist for God's purpose. And you see that there are more pressing matters than what we're pressed about. I, I, just, I just meet people, you're just so pressed 
about all of these issues all the time that you heard on, on the news. And they're just, they're owning you. And, and the day is drawing near in the next section. He says, we're closer to the end than when we first believed. We're, we're, in, we're finishing. And, and we, we've had this 250-year window of opportunity in America, and it's closing. And we're so busy redressing the government rather than pressing the claims of Christ and souls upon people. The nation is decaying rapidly, I agree. It's atheistic, it's godless. But we go preach Jesus Christ into this world. They won't let us pray in schools anymore. Go pray. You can't put 10 commandments on the wall. Then go put them in their heart to the gospel. The government will not proclaim Christ. That is what we exist for, to bring men to God and God to men. May I suggest that the problem is not that we have gotten out of the political process, but we've become uninvolved in proclaiming the Word of God and going into this society. Truth has been diluted. We aren't even seeing people transformed in the church, much less in society. 1 Timothy 2.1 First of all, then, Paul says, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings <coughs> and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God, I pray for our government so that we can go forth and proclaim this gospel to, to those whom God wants to draw. I pray for those in authority, serve for what God has ordained them to do so that we can in all godliness go preach Jesus Christ. The recovery of this nation will not be through the political realm, but it will be God pouring out His Holy Spirit and breaking open heaven. Amen. So go out. Go out to abortion clinics with the gospel. Love the poor and the homeless and the needy. Go. But go as forgiven sinners. And it just takes the arrogance and the pride out of our resistance. Go do it for the sake of love and go shine forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sixthly, our last point, because they are servants of God, in verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God. It's an interesting that this word for servants in the Septuagint refers to people who served in the temple. They're servants of God, I pray that God will give us eyes this morning to see this. I, I hate to say this. The IRS is the context here. <laughs> They're servants of God. Our taxes go to paying these servants' salaries. If they did not exist, uh, most would not pay their taxes out of just generosity. We would lose this common grace, and taxes have been hated throughout the history of the world. And by paying them, you're not saying, I agree with how they spend it. It's, it's to do it gladly to the Lord every April 15th. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and I always like to say, not a penny more. <laughs> but I get to pay my taxes. And I'll flush that out now in our application. So let's try to start applying all these beautiful things that Paul's teaching us in Romans. First, we're not to go into society <coughs> to, to seek to change it. I'm sorry, we are to go into society. Big difference. We're to seek to change it with the message of Jesus Christ and a righteousness that surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees. We, we are salt and light, and we enter into this world as that. And we love the orphan and the widow and the poor. That's got to be in our hearts. It's God's heart. We help the needy. We visit those in prison and we help the sick. We help women not slaughter their unborn children. We want to see justice and righteousness advanced in our nation. We just want to go be Christ in this world. And that's what Paul's not ashamed of is this gospel because it's the power of God to bring salvation to all. And so I want to enter in with this one thing that can change people. And so that's our hearts. We enter in and we love and we have the gospel that can change and transform. If you've come here this morning 
and you need this gospel. God sent his son into the world to go up on a cross and die for your sins so that they could be forgiven. I pray that you would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 7 then, render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, and custom to whom custom, and fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Render means to pay back something that is owed. That's an interesting word. Taxes are not voluntary or optional offerings. It's, it's what we owe. It's what we owe. Cheating on taxes is a crime against the government, but a sin against God. So he says, render what you owe. Tax to whom tax, that's probably the income or property tax. Render custom to whom custom, that's probably the, the poll tax or a goods tax. You ought to give to the government, one commentator said, as willingly as you give to the church. <laughs> They're both worship to God. How's it? All of us be quiet. We are, not, we are not only to render our assets, but he wants our attitudes. Okay? Just not, okay, here it is. He's saying, I, I just want your attitudes. Give fear to whom fear is due. Sincere respect for civil authorities. They've been put up above you by God and we're to have a respect for their power. Give honor to whom honor is due. Give a high esteem that is genuine, a respect for their office that they've been placed in. And so the way we speak about them and, uh, and, and to them manifests the spirit. Guys, this is just so polluted around us. To have this kind of a heart and spirit is what Paul is calling for. But Paul doesn't know what it's like to live in a bad government. <laughs> we are not conformed to this world. We're not to be conformed, Romans 12, 2. And we will not conform to this world's way of opposing government and speaking ill. Uh, we're, we're those who are submissive and at peace. And we do everything we can to bring righteousness into this world. James Boyce, one of the late great preachers, said this. The wonderful thing about this is that if we begin by showing respect to those whom respect is due and honor to those whom honor is due, above all showing honor and respect to God, then others may learn something of God through us and eventually maybe come to respect, honor, and love Him too, which is salvation in the beginning of wisdom. And may we be lights in a dark world. So as we close out the series, I just want to try to balance this passage with what we call the analogy of Scripture. Uh, there's a lot of other passages about this subject in the Bible, but I just wanted us to understand what Paul was saying before we addressed him. So let's take a look at trying to balance this out. Do, do we ever oppose government? Do we ever speak out against it? Do we, do we ever engage in battling unjust laws and unjust practices in our land? <clears throat> I'm going to go over a few principles. The first one is submission resists rebellion against authority. All human authority comes from God. He says they're servants of God and they're ministers of God. They're there by God's decree. Your, your husband, a father, a teacher, an employer, an elder, a president, David, David would not get Saul. He said, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. I, I won't stretch my hand out against God's one he anointed. This seeking to rebel, I'm telling you, it's satanic. It's demonic to try to take down what God has established all of your days. The family is broken. The family's broken. We got the, the women's live movement with marriages. We got men dominating their, their wives. We got kids who will not obey and submit to their parents. And you think it's cool. And the whole thing is against God. It's not your parents that you're disobeying and dishonoring. It's God. It's not your, your, your husband. Who, who you're, it's, it's God. And so I want you to see this whole picture of authority. The workforce is anarchy. I mean, I, I, Laura had someone who came to interview for a job and said, well, you, you need to pay me $50 to come for an interview. You know, and we just got this mindset as everybody owes me everything and you're just radical rebels to your employers. The church, in talking to friends I have from seminary and pastors around the, the world and area, many are thinking about stepping back. They said it's become so unruly trying to shepherd the flock of God in this spirit and age. The government, there is just no respect given to the office. 
in this land. The bright lights that we will be if we get this principle. Peaceful, submitting citizens who pursue good to all the hurting and needing around us by bringing truth and love into this dark world. That's the kingdom of God. So I just want to start with dealing with this, this inner rebellion. To just start there first. And then second, submission recognizes the failings of authority. Men and women are fallen and corrupt. They'll never be perfect authority this side of glory. Submission is not based on the character of the one in authority. 1 Peter 2.18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. Ever have an unreasonable boss? <laughs> I, I won't even ask. Ever had an unreasonable husband? <clears throat> 1 Peter 3.1, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they might be won without a word by your behavior, chaste and respectful behavior of their wives. Third, then, submission rejects sinning for authority. If all authority is from God, if the government then under Him commands you to do something contrary to the one that they're under and that we're under, um, that's where we stay in submission to God. I don't come out from under God because my government tells me to do something against God. That's just true of all submission. Anyone, anyone that you're called to submit to, if they try to lead you away from God, that's where your submission stops. It's not in subordination to not sin. And I have so many examples, but we're about out of time. Uh, Daniel with Darius, I, I won't bow down and worship. Acts 4.19, Peter and John answered and said to the government, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking of what we've seen and heard, which is Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And they're saying, quit preaching. And they're like, we can't. We cannot. Acts 5.28, uh, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, Jesus. And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood, Jesus, upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, we must obey God rather than men. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was right to speak out against Hitler and to begin home churches against the laws of the land. It was right to smuggle Bibles into China. Corey Ten Boon to hide the Jews to save their lives. And right now, the government does not command anyone to have an abortion, but if it does, we must obey God rather than man. When it says you can't discipline your children, and the Word of God says you must discipline your children, I have to obey God. If it demands that you get a shot for COVID, <laughs> is there a problem with the sound? I'll answer that later if we have time. <laughs> Number four, submission then accepts the consequences of obeying God rather than man. And I want you to get this. Paul's in prison and he's being beaten. Peter's been thrown in prison. And the reason being is we can resist the action of the government, but not the government. Bonhoeffer resisted and he went to prison. He eventually was martyred. The, when it says don't preach against homosexuality and you're preaching through Romans 1 and then you go to prison. John Bunyan was in prison for preaching the gospel and someone said, why are you in prison? And he said, why are you not in prison? <laughs> so I want you to see that we obey God, but we're still under authority. And if that authority brings the consequences for our obedience to God, that is an opportunity for the gospel. Paul's writing in Philippi saying, I rejoice that I'm in prison because the whole praetorium guard is coming to faith because I'm locked up in here. There's beautiful things that God does as we stay in submission. But when someone asks me to disobey the one I'm truly in submission to, I will not obey. And I'll accept the consequences if, even if it be our life. Amen. Fifthly, 
Submission responds within the sphere of authority. This is a tricky principle, but God has given authority to the government, but He's also given authority to a husband and a wife and a home, to parents and children. So each of them have a sphere that God has given. And so the government does not have jurisdiction over every single facet of life. And so to, for, for the, the church, the elders are to oversee the body of Christ and we're to go to the word of God and we're to direct it according to his word. And if the government comes in and says, we're taking over this sphere and we're going to tell you how to run the church, that's where I don't have to stay in that submission. Raising children uh, when, the, when they, the government starts telling you that you can't discipline, you can't do this, they, they've come into a realm now that you're called to parent. So it's a matter of territory and what is its jurisdiction. Christ said, render to Caesar the thing that are Caesar's. Give to your husband what is your husband's. Give to your parents what is your parents'. So what do we do if the government then acts outside of their authority? <laughs> so if... If an elder starts telling you uh, your daughter has to marry this person, you, you'll say, that, that's not my authority. I, I have no authority to tell you that. So that would be lawful disobedience. If an unsaved husband says to you, you can't go to church. No, Christ has the authority in that realm. And Hebrews 10 says, don't forsake the assembling together. So if she goes to church, she's not an insubordinate woman. You're to submit even if you don't like it or agree with it, if it's in its jurisdiction and it's not against God where we don't submit. So let's say, I just came up with a few examples. They're probably bad. Uh, so let's say that the beef is bad and that we got mad cow's disease going through our land and the government says, you can't eat any more beef because it's killing people. I, I can obey that. When they say, uh, you, you can only water on Mondays and Fridays. You can't do fireworks because of the great danger of fire. There's a realm that they're to protect. Uh, abortion. Abortion. We have very sincere Christians who, who they'll go and they'll, they'll disobey authority. They'll block entrances. They'll, they'll, one time there was one shot. Is the right of private property a valid law? We're not to break perfectly valid laws. Is the government wrong to protect persons and properties? Is that within its jurisdiction? Is the government wrong to allow abortion? You bet. Should we protest it? Yes. Should we vote against it? Yes. Should we try to persuade people with the truth? Yes. But Chuck Colson said, in our day, breaking laws to make a dramatic point is the ultimate logic of terrorism and not civil disobedience. And so that's why I talked about as we live in the gospel and we do protest and we stand against things, we come in humility versus just pride and arrogance and smelling up the whole area. We're, we're humble and we're coming and we're saying, I can't agree with this. And we stand against it. So I know there are a million other questions and different scenarios and that's what your community groups are for. Uh, my heart right now is in America is that we know how to live out the will of God. And I hope that God has been pleased to boil off a dokimos of wrong thinking toward government. And I want it to be an act of worship where we think rightly about government that's been established by God and, and from the heart that we submit to our God, to our government. So I'm going to close with a letter that I, I think just captures Romans 12 very well in 13 an epistle to Diognetus, an anonymous second century Christian wrote this following beautiful description of believers who genuinely obey the commands of Romans 12 and 13. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is the gospel can come out of this and that's what this letter is going to draw out. So I pray that each one of you listen and just say, is this me? Christians are distinguished from other men and women, neither by country nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities <coughs> of their own, nor they employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, 
nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves to be advocates of any merely human doctrines. But inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according to the lot of each of them had determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners, they're just passing through. As citizens, they share in all the things with others, and yet they endure all things as if they're foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all, they beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. <clears throat> they have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they're citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time, they surpass the laws by their lives. They live more excellent than the laws. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They're unknown and condemned. They're put to death and they're restored to life. They're poor, but they make many rich. They're in lack of all things, and yet they abound in all. They're dishonored, and yet they're, they're very dishonored. They're glorified. They are evil spoken of, and yet they're justified. They're reviled, and they bless. They're insulted, and they repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They're assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are, are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. They can't even find a reason for why they hate them except that they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a living sacrifice that is not to be conformed to this world, but to the, the will of God. And so I, I pray for grace that that letter would be Southside Bible Church and that we would put on display the beauties and the glories of Christ by living out Romans 12 and 13 in our midst. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you. I thank you for the beauties of what you're showing us. When you declared us justified, you also gave us a new heart. You regenerated us from death to life. And you put the Holy Spirit within us and you joined us as one to Jesus Christ. And now the fruit that flows out of this whole new relationship is the fruit that we're studying. So God, this fruit comes by faith, comes by living and believing the gospel. And I pray that you'll make us into these kind of men, women, and children so that the gospel would be put on display and many would come to know Jesus Christ. God, check our hearts this morning. We need to repent. Help us not to fight the Word of God. Lord, help us to come under you in this area of governing authorities and all authorities in our lives. God, so that Jesus would be adored and worshiped. He'd be shown worthy by the way we live these godly lives of submission. Lord, I thank you that the unreasonable authorities are the ones that glorify you the most. They're the ones that put you on display the most by our submission. And so, God, I pray, pray that we would have that spirit to one another, to be in submission to each other and wash one another's feet. God, do mighty things in our hearts, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.